chapter 21 as we continue in our series on the book of Acts. And just a reminder, the book of Acts is not just the history of the church. It is our story as well. We are continuing out these marching orders as we are the church. And we are going to pick up right where last week we left. And that was where the Ephesian elders knew it was the last time they were going to see the Apostle Paul. And they were filled with with tears and with love for him. And they prayed over him and they wept over him. Well, we are picking up here in Acts 21 as now Paul, accompanied by Luke, is headed towards Jerusalem. And in Acts 21, the Holy Spirit reveals that he is going to face persecution and suffering when he's in Jerusalem. Now, we know as the story continues that he is going to, this is going to end up leading to his death. But we see a powerful gift that God gives Christians in the context of Acts chapter 21. And that is the gift of spiritual friendship. And I'm not talking about what the world defines as friendship. We're going to look today as God's provision, God's plan for spiritual friendship. So no matter what age we are, if we are a believer in Christ, there is a different relationship we have with other believers than we do with the rest of the world. And we're going to look at that. But what we're going to start by seeing is in verses 12 through 14, this friendship that Paul has with these believers. So I'd like to read Acts 21, verses 12 through 14, to see their response to Paul's decision to go to Jerusalem. When we heard this, we and the people there pleaded with Paul not to go to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I am ready not only to go be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. When he would not be dissuaded, we gave up and said, the Lord's will be done. I don't know about you, but there have been so many times in my life where it was a painful season, a challenging season, and God used spiritual friends, Christian friends, to be an extension of God's comfort, God's love and truth. That was so valuable to me. And I'm sure you all have experienced that. I hope you have experienced that. Brothers and sisters in Christ who together we seek God's strength, his comfort, his truth, his will for our lives. And to be honest, that during those times, their advice wasn't always without fault. Their response wasn't always without fault. But there was a common thread, a pursuit of Jesus. And that was more valuable than even the relief of that trial or burden to know I wasn't alone. And I had brothers and sisters in Christ praying for me, walking this out with me. I love the explanation of spiritual friendship from professor and author by the name of Paul J. Waddell. And it's on the screen so you can see it. But this is what he says about spiritual friendship. Every friendship is formed around shared goods that identify the friendship and help the friends understand the life and purpose of the friendship. In spiritual friendship, the principal good is a mutual love for Christ and a desire to grow together in Christ. This is what distinguishes spiritual friendship from other relationships. In spiritual friendships, the friends are centered in Christ. They seek Christ, and they strive to live according to Christ. Through their friendship, they want to help one another live a godly and holy life. They want each other to be resplendent in goodness. Now, we all have friends that are developed through a shared good. So, for example... If, if there are people in the community, you, you can have a friendship based upon a common community that you live in. Maybe it's an interest. Maybe it's a profession where you have a shared good. And there is a friendship that is developed because of that shared relationship. Maybe it's music. Maybe it's farming. Whatever it is, there is a, a connection there. 
But what we're talking about today goes much deeper than that. Because what we're talking about today and what we see in the life of the Apostle Paul is a spiritual relationship that has a greater common denominator than just an interest or common events in life. And this is what God is calling us to. So to look at this and how to live this out in our life, we have to first look at the exigency of spiritual friendships. If you have your bulletin, you can follow along. We're going to walk through this. The exigency of spiritual friendships. If you have been following with us through the book of Acts, you see everywhere Paul goes, he has someone with him. Now, a lot of that, the author of Acts, Luke, was with him. But even in the times when Paul is, is beaten and he's in prison, he's there. He's there with Silas or, or he goes through these missionary journeys and he's got Timothy for the first one. Paul is not alone. He has a co-labor, someone who is living this out with him. He is a perfect example that as Christians, we are not to be a lone wolf. We are not to be Lone Ranger, or for those of you who like Star Wars, as Christians, there is no Han Solo as Christians. Han Duo, Trio, but not Solo. We are called to share life together, and we are not to be an island, right? We are to have brothers and sisters in Christ who share our pursuit of Christ with us. Now, I chose the word exigency because that gives emphasis on the urgency of the need. It represents a pressing requirement. God made us to have spiritual friends. God made us for that. So some might say, well, well, because you need spiritual friends, that represents a weakness. No, that represents design. Apostle Paul didn't have a weakness that he needed friends. No, God made him that way. God made us for friendship, people, brothers and sisters to pray with, to seek God with, to cry together, to laugh together. And this is what we see in Paul's life. But we also see the same pattern in Jesus' life. In three years of his public ministry, do you know what Jesus, as, as J.B. said, what did he call his disciples? Friends. There, there was, an, there was an, an emotional and relational intimacy that Jesus invited them into. And it was that they were on mission, that they had the same pursuit of God's will. And Jesus invited them into that. Author and minister Tim Keller says the following regarding this issue. He says, to need and to want deep spiritual friendships is not a sign of spiritual immaturity, but it's actually a sign of spiritual maturity. It's not a sign of weakness, but a sign of health. If we go back to Genesis chapter 2, and if you're familiar with the beginning of the world, you know that God made everything good, right? That there was no sin in the beginning. That came when Adam and Eve sinned and as deceived by the devil who was in the form of a serpent. And we see that everything was good. Except, except the first man, Adam, was alone. In Genesis 2, 18, it says, The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. Tim Keller goes on in his book, Spiritual Friendship, to say, Adam was not lonely because he was imperfect. He was lonely because he was perfect. The ache for friends is, one, is the one ache that that's not the result of sin. God made us in such a way that we couldn't even enjoy paradise without friends, human friends. Keller goes on to say, Adam had a perfect quiet time every day for 24 hours a day, yet he needed friends. So if you're lonely, he goes on to write, you are not dysfunctional, you're fine. You're lonely because you're not a machine. You're lonely because you were built this way. Now, Keller goes on to write, he says, but I have to be careful because for some people, 
There is a reason that they are lonely because of sin in their life and they're pushing others out. But that's not how we are designed not to be alone. We are designed to have a passion for spiritual friendship, the need for spiritual friendship, the sense of the lack of it, and that is not wrong. We need spiritual friendships. There is an urgent need for our lives to have brothers and sisters who share life with us as we pursue Christ. So as we've established the urgency, now I want to look at the establishment. So how does this take place? Because we are sinful, broken people, and we will ruin everything that God gives us if it's up to us, all right? So how is the establishment of spiritual friendship? Well, if you have given your life to Jesus, if you said, I believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, he has died for me, and you repent of your sins, you confess his name, you are baptized into his death and resurrection, what happens is, is not only is your relationship with God changed, where you become a child of God, he is your father, but your relationship with other believers change. Now there is a spiritual connection And we see that in Paul. He goes to all these places that have different cultures, backgrounds, but there is something in common that he can connect with them. And so just as it was with Paul back then and just as it is today and just as it will be until Christ returns, we need to understand that the common denominator between believers is Jesus. It's not that we always agree. It's not that we always get along, but it is Jesus. And Jesus is greater than anything that can be a difference or a divide between us relationally. So what that means is spiritual friendships can exist between the rock star and the farmer. Spiritual friendships can exist between a millennial and a baby boomer. Spiritual friendships can exist between the vegan and the meat eater and even the IU fan and the Purdue fan. There can be spiritual friendship because the common denominator is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and he is greater than anything that divides us. Amen, that's good news. Well, Paul gives a great example. He's writing to the believers in Galatia and he's writing to the church there And he points out this very truth. Because in that culture, there was great cultural divides. There was was walls relationally that separated people. And he gives some examples that we're going to look at here in Galatians 3, 26 through 28. But then he points out a unifying factor greater than all those differences. This is what he says. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now, does that mean that they were no longer male or female? or slave, or free, or Jew. No, it meant that their relational, their relational connection changed beyond what was natural and what would divide. Now they had a spiritual connection, a spiritual identity, that there is nothing that can separate or divide. And that is Jesus. And we can look through our culture and we can go through our culture and go, boy, a lot of things can divide people and separate Christians. But we need to understand the power of the cross overcame any division, any separation. So if there is not a spiritual friendship or not a unity between brothers and sisters in Christ, it's because of us, not because of Jesus, because he overcame it. And he invites us into a unity. See, Jesus is that common denominator, and he is greater than anything that divides. So there are no distinctions, no divisions that can stand between those that belong to Christ. All believers, without exception, are one in Jesus. So my question is for you, are there still barriers and walls of separation that you struggle with between Christian, other believers? Are there sharp lines keeping you from having spiritual friendships and fellowship with believers who are different than you? If so, please understand Jesus is greater and pray and set your heart before him to change that, heal that 
unify that in you and that other person. So we've looked at the urgent need. We've looked at how this can exist among sinful, divisive people. Last of all, how can we live this out? This is the application part. How can we live this out? How can we express and grow in spiritual friendships? I believe there are four ways that we're going to move through quickly. Four ways spiritual friendships are expressed in Paul's life as seen in Acts 21. The first is through practicing hospitality. Practicing hospitality. From verses 1 through 16 in Acts 21, we see Paul stay in four different homes. Four to, he's not going to the, to the local you know, Holiday Inn. He's staying in other believers' homes. There was this relational openness and a relational awareness that they saw their homes as an extension of God's love to other people. They saw in that their homes were gifts as a way to minister and bless others. The Greek word for hospitality means the readiness to share generosity by meeting people's needs in one's home. The readiness to share generosity by meeting people's needs in one's home. Some of you do an amazing job at that. Some of you are like, no, this is God's. I, I, people can stay with me. I want to minister to them. I want to have people over. This is, this is the way that God wants me to love other people. But the reality is there's a lot of Christians who struggle with seeing their home as a refuge. And I'll be honest, that, that, was, that was me. I struggled with that. Jane, on the other hand, she was like, bring everybody, every single stranger in the world, bring them, you know, and I'm over there like, er, nope. Nope, it's my space, my refuge. Now, a lot of that had to do with the fact that my profession, as hopefully you know, is in ministry. And so I was always, in my mind, ministering to people. And I wanted to go home and just kind of, you know, clock out for a minute. You know, you know take a break. And what God revealed to me is that was a heart issue. That was a lordship issue because I claimed ownership of my time and I claimed ownership to be able to say, God, this is when I'm available and this is when I'm not. It's not in the evening, it's not on the weekends. I'm not available, I've clocked out. See, that's a heart issue. And as I do so many things, I take it to the, to the extreme. I wanted to be in charge and own my time. And boy, when there's something out of order in our life, God is faithful. And he is so faithful to match us with a spouse that's just the opposite. And it's a painful reminder all the time that she's right. And I'm like, oh, you know, seriously. But God has been so faithful and over the past couple years has been tearing that down. Now, boundaries are good. My family is my first ministry focus. That is true. But for me, it was an issue of the heart, and I needed to deal with it. And so now we're living out in unity, being able to open our home to others as an extension of ministry. What about you in hospitality? Is that an area God wants you to be able to be faithful to increase spiritual friendships in your life? The second way is through showing affection. As we see Paul last week at the end of his time with the Ephesian elders that he was with for three years, I mean, they are crying, they're hugging and kissing him as he leaves because they know it's the last time they're going to see him. And here's the thing, God gave us emotions, he gave us affection as a way to be able to love each other and to be able to minister to each other. Now, I do have to say that has to be in context of relational priority. And so if you are married, you shouldn't be showing affection to somebody else who you're not married to. They, these are common things, but we have to point this out, right? There is boundaries with this honoring marriage, honoring the leadership of the church, but there is such a need for us to show affection and to open our heart to each other. That is so important. And honestly, that's something that I feel like a lot of us need to grow in. 
opening our hearts to other people and allowing affection between each other. Now, I'm reading through this and I'm reminded of the times that the Apostle Paul in his epistles says, brothers in Christ, greet each other with a holy kiss. And I just have to say, I'm not spiritual enough for that. Okay, I will do a man hug. I mean, we're going to do a man hug. We're going to, you know, but I, I just can't do that. I'm, I'm not holy enough, I guess. I don't know. But all kidding aside is we have to open our heart and be affectionately loving to each other. There's a powerful ministry that takes place. We see that in Paul's life. The third way is through praying together. The Ephesian elders, they are praying with Paul in Acts 20, 36. Acts 21, 5, we see the believers entire as they are loving and praying for Paul. This is what it says in Acts 21, 5. But when our time was up, we left and continued on our way. All the disciples and their wives and children accompanied us out of the city. And there on the beach, we knelt to pray. Now, Whenever I read scripture, I'm always like, God, how do you want to speak to me? What, what's the deeper application and revelation here? And first of, all, first of all, I think we need to do more praying on the beach. That's what I read. So if anybody's going to Florida or something, I would love to pray with you. Just take care of the accommodations and everything. And I would love to have my feet in the sand and pray with you. No, honestly, the thing that we see here is who was praying over Paul? Who was praying over Paul? Friends, but they were families. They had a spiritual bond as friends, but it was mothers and fathers. And it was children. I think we need to do that more is when there are situations that we need to seek God, we invite the whole family, we train kids up when they're young, the power of prayer and the importance of the church gathering together beyond age and generation and praying and seeking God together. That's what we see here. That's a beautiful picture. I think we need to do that more. We can do that more in our families and more in the church family. My family's really good. We pray, we pray at, you know, at, at meals. But doing more, if, if we hear of someone who has a health issue or someone struggling, just stopping and saying, you know what, let's just pray for them right now. And leading your children and being that example is so important. And if it's on the beach, that's okay. That's good, right? But praying together as families. The last thing we see is this f- spiritual friendship grows and is expressed through overcoming different opinions in pursuit of God's will. If you notice, when Paul is getting ready to leave, his spiritual friends who love him, their hearts are breaking for him. They're like, don't go to Jerusalem. Don't do it. You're going to die. Don't go. And Paul was being led by the Holy Spirit. And there was such unity and love in that relationship that they could disagree. Paul went ahead to Jerusalem, and actually Paul said to them, no, I need to go. And their response was not, oh, well, you don't care about me. My feelings don't matter. No, that's not what we see. Also, they didn't say, well, you offended me. How dare you disagree with me? No, they said God's will be done because the common place was not their opinion. Sorry. The common place was Jesus. They submitted their rights of their feelings, rights of their opinion, rights of their perspective. They submitted all of that to the authority of Jesus, which was their common denominator. And they were able to share their opinion. And I love it. Paul didn't make this decision in secret. He allowed them to have input. And even though they didn't agree, there was still unity because they said, your will be done, God. Your will be done. How important is that for us that even through different opinions, we pursue and rest in God's will. That is spiritual friendships. That is Jesus being the source and power of that relationship. So there you go. Spiritual friendships. Hopefully you understand we need it. 
We need spiritual friendships. Jesus is the source of that. And we live that out by faithfully allowing Christ to be first as we offer hospitality, that we show affection, that we are able to overcome our differences and our disagreements, and that we pray together. That is when Jesus will bless our relationships and that we will continue to grow in him as we go and be the church. Amen? Is that good stuff? All right. Right now what I'm going to do is invite the worship team back up. We're going to do an invitation song. And I've asked JB if he would pray over all of us in two ways. First of all, pray that the power of Jesus would continue to be at work on our spiritual friendships. They will continue to be for his glory. The second is the reality that sometimes spiritual friendships, we've been hurt because Jesus wasn't the center, because we got our feelings hurt. And that spiritual friendship created distance and left that place where Christ is Lord. And so then we walk around with these relational scars. And so I've asked JB to also pray if that applies to you, if there needs to be some healing in your heart to let people in. Because it's hard when we get hurt. It's hard when people disappoint us. But to know Jesus, Jesus is that common denominator, and he is that source of that unity together. Jamie. Dear Heavenly Father, it's through you that we have life to the full. And because we have that life to the full, Lord, you fill us with friends. You fill us with those uh, people that, that maybe we've grown up with, people that we have met through school, people that have common bonds through church and, and community. And, and those people in our lives are so valuable. And Lord, we praise you and we thank you for those people. They, they help fill us and they give us opportunity, Lord, to serve and, and to be a part of that community and, and to be a part of a shared life, um, to be there for them when, when they need support. All those things, Lord, play into to that and, and we praise you for that. And then there are friendships Friendships that get broken. Times where our hearts break because of, of words said or, or deeds done that um, are, are out of order, out of place, not in your will. And, and, and things all of a sudden crumble and fall apart. But we know, Lord, that you are faithful, that you are wise. And if we can just allow you to fill us and we reach out and then we can enjoy the impact of that friendship all over again. Lord, it is built stronger and better than ever before. And I pray that over any brokenness that exists in this church. I pray that over any brokenness that exists outside of this church with the people of this congregation. Lord, Heal us and let us remember it is through you that we understand what love and relationship is all about. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.